Hello and welcome to our session on plants, their parts and functions. My name's Helen Ward and this is Lydia. My name is Lydia Ahern and we are going to look at plants, parts and functions today and we would recommend if you have your worksheet printed off to keep it with you throughout the session. In this session, we will learn about the different parts of a plant and each of their functions. By functions, we mean the job that each part of the plant does to keep the plant alive and to help it thrive. Before we start, let's do a check. Can you name the different parts of a plant? There are four main parts. Perhaps work from the bottom of the plant to the top. Did you think of all four? Let's check. We've got the roots the stem or trunk if the plant you are thinking of is a tree, then the leaves and the flowers. We are going to look at each plant part on a deeper level and learn about its role in plant life. Let's begin with the roots, the part at the bottom of a plant. Although most, but not all plants have roots, they don't all look the same and they don't all do the same job or function. Let's begin by saying that not all plants have roots. For example, mosses, which use root-like growths to help anchor them to the ground, called rhizoids. However, these rhizoids are not like roots because they do not help in the transportation of minerals and water. I've just given you a hint to the functions of the roots. There are two. Did you hear them? The first is to hold and support the plant. Roots keep the plant in the ground and give it support. Even air plants that grow hanging onto trees, their roots hold them in place. The second job of the roots is to play a part in the system that gets nutrients and water to all parts of the plant. When it comes to roots, there are two main types, tap roots and fibrous roots. You can see from the pictures the main difference. A tap root system has one large main root that does most of the work. Fibrous roots have lots of smaller sized roots which spread out. Interestingly, we actually eat a lot of tap roots as food. Can you think of some examples? Carrots, parsnips, beetroot and radishes are some good examples. So, as you can see, without roots, plants would not have an anchor or support. And an important part of the system that provides plants with nutrients and water would be missing. As Lydia identified, roots help to anchor the plant in the soil so it doesn't fall over. Look upwards into this tree. Can you see the branches and the leaves, all of which the roots need to hold in place? However, if you look at the bottom of the tree, badgers have made their home. It helps us to see the amount and types of root that the tree has in order to stabilise it and collect water and minerals. The job of the stem, or its function, is to provide the plant with support. The trunk also provides the structure and support, but for the whole tree, including its stems, leaves, fruits and flowers. Both woody and non-woody stems 
contain transport tubes. One set of tubes carries water and minerals from the ground up to the leaves. The leaves are where the plant makes its own food and the food is then transported back down the plant through another set of transport tubes. In the woody stem, you can see them coloured in yellow and green. Interestingly, woody plants grow from the outside. They don't grow from the inside. Our non-woody stems might be plants that only last a year, called annuals or perennials, but they are not the sort of plant that might last for hundreds of years, like a tree. Here you can see the transport tubes in action. If you look carefully in the base of the cup, you'll see two balloons. We cut the plant stem in two and put half in each balloon. In the balloon, there were different coloured dyes. Why do you think the very end of the flower has remained white? Looking at the transport tubes in action provides a great range of investigative activities. You might want to think of an idea for yourself. In this picture, we didn't use food dye, but use the inside of a felt tip pen. Please get an adult to help you. We investigated what happened to the colour of the flower over time. What other variables could you have changed? What could you have measured? And do you think the type of flower or plant makes a difference to the time it takes or the colour that the plant and flower might change to? Next, let's talk about arguably the prettiest part of the plant, the flowers. But did you know that plants have pretty flowers for a reason? This is the flower's job or function, to attract pollinators. Plants are actually designed to have certain colours and scents or smells to attract certain insects or birds to pollinate them. Have you ever seen a bee or butterfly hovering above a flower? They are actually pollinating the plant which means they are helping the plant to reproduce more plants by taking nectar and encouraging the plant to produce seeds. What is remarkable is that you can work out by looking at a plant how it is pollinated and not all plants have obvious flowers. How does that work? Well, where you see plants with bright colours and stronger scents, these are animal pollinated plants. They attract insects or birds, for example, to take nectar and then transfer pollen from their flowers to other flowers. Here we have included two interesting examples. The magnolia tree produces its flowers before the leaves to make sure that the flowers are visible and can easily be accessed by pollinators. Once pollination is complete, that's when the leaves will grow. Another plant with flowers is the snapdragon. Its flowers attract pollinators but also this plant is picky. It only wants certain creatures to pollinate it. Therefore, when a creature comes along and lands on the flower, if it is the correct size, it will cause the flower to open for the pollinator to access the nectar inside and get pollen as an extra present. What about plants with no bright colored or smelling flowers? Like the grasses I've included here, plants without obvious, bright and attractive smelling flowers are usually wind pollinated, meaning that the wind moves the pollen for these plants and they don't need animals to do it, so they don't need colours or smells. Now that we have learned about the different types of pollination and how plants may or may not have brightly coloured smelling flowers depending on the type of pollination, you should be able to figure out how each of the following plants is pollinated. Can you work it out? What is the difference and how can you tell? Yes, the plants with flowers, the dahlia, verbena and aster here, 
are animal pollinated, which is why they have bright flowers to attract pollinators. And then we have the plants without the very obvious flowers, pine trees, corn and wheat, which are wind pollinated and therefore don't need bright flowers to attract pollinators. Well done. As Lydia has told you, the type of flower can help you understand how it might be pollinated. Here we have a picture of a flower being pollinated by a bird. In the next slide, you'll see a bee that came to collect pollen from one plant in my garden and to take it to another plant. You can see the bee visiting the florets of this blue flower. As it flies round, it's looking for nectar, which is produced by the plant in order to help with pollination. The bee has to climb past stamens in order to get the nectar. And you can see the yellow stamens full of pollen, and that pollen is rubbed onto the bee's body and it very helpfully transferred that pollen from one plant to the next. Leaves are not only very important for the plants, but they're incredibly important for us too. The leaves are where plants make their own food. And without them making food, then there would be no food for the rest of us. Can you see the variation in the types of leaves on this page? How could you group them? I'm sure that all of you have seen a horse chestnut before. Can you see its leaves are attached all in one go and it's almost like the palm of a hand? You might want to investigate the different names for the different styles of leaf. The elm on the very far hand side is a simple leaf, but even so, it's got serrated edges, which the simple leaf of the willow underneath doesn't have. What shape is a silver birch? And did you know that the common ash, each of those leaflets is considered to be part of one leaf? Which other plants have leaflets? shown on this page. You might want to collect some leaves and classify them yourselves according to the shape and the type of the leaf. As we have mentioned, we actually eat many different parts of different plants. Let's see if you can name a few. Can you think of any plants that have roots we eat? Examples include onions, carrots, radishes and beetroot. Which stems do we eat? We like to eat stems such as asparagus, celery and rhubarb. What leafy plants do we enjoy? 
Leaves that we eat include lettuce, spinach and herbs like basil. Which plants have flowers that we eat? Did you know that part of the cauliflower and broccoli we eat is actually the flower? We also enjoy flowers such as chamomile and jasmine as tea. We also enjoy seeds as a source of food. Can you think of any that you like? Some examples are sunflower seeds, sesame seeds and linseeds. Did you know that corn, rice and wheat are also the seeds of the plant? Here we have also added some unusual seeds like a coconut, mango and the world's largest seed that we eat called coco de mer. Next time you're enjoying a meal, have a little think about what plants you are eating and perhaps try to identify which part of the plant it is. Lydia talked to you all about the different parts of the plant and what we eat. In this activity, we're going to use a Carroll diagram to work out what is a fruit and what's not a fruit. A fruit contains seeds. This is a Carroll diagram. It was named after Lewis Carroll, the person that wrote Alice in Wonderland. Carroll diagrams are used to group things according to whether they have a certain criteria or not. Our criteria today is scientist fruit or not scientist fruit, chef's fruit or not chef's fruit. A chef's fruit is something that a cook or a chef or maybe you at home would use to make a pudding or a sweet. A not chef fruit is something that you wouldn't necessarily want to have with custard. A scientist fruit will contain seeds. If it doesn't contain seeds, often it wouldn't be considered to be a fruit. Here are some things to put in your Carol diagram. While making a decision about which box they go into, Decide, does it have seeds? If it does, it's a scientist's fruit. If it doesn't, it's not a scientist's fruit. As for the chef, make a decision. Do you think the chef would make a pudding or a dessert using this item? Or do you think they wouldn't? So is it a chef's fruit or not a chef's fruit? We've done four for you to give you a helping hand. In the first box, it covers both scientist fruit and chef's fruit. So the chef's fruit goes along the top and the scientist fruit goes down. In the scientist fruit and the chef's fruit, we've got grapes. Although some can be seedless, grapes can contain seeds and it's a fruit. Cucumber contain seeds. It's a scientist's fruit. However, there are not many chefs who would use it for pudding. Rhubarb is something that is often found in a crumble or a pie. So it'll be a chef's fruit. But scientists don't count it as a fruit because it has no seeds. Broccoli is in the not chef's fruit, not scientist's fruit. As you found out previously, it's a flower. It doesn't contain seeds. And hopefully, we don't have it with custard. Using worksheet one, which is the Carroll diagram that we've worked with already, can you sort all of these items into the appropriate columns and if you want to can you add additional ones that would go into columns where you don't have many examples we'll come back to the answers in the chat so you're doing sorting grouping and classifying which is a type of working scientifically
STEM ambassadors are volunteers from a wide range of science, technology, engineering and mathematics related jobs and disciplines from across the UK. All STEM ambassadors offer their time and enthusiasm to bring STEM subjects to life and to demonstrate the value of them for future life and careers for young people. Chris is a STEM ambassador who works in the horticultural sector. He always attends the jamboree, bringing with him tomato plants and a range of insects that pollinate them. Whilst this isn't possible this time, it's amazing to see his workplace. And in this video, you get to see a tour and some useful information about how tomatoes are grown under glass. Hi, I'm Chris from your open nursery and we grow tomatoes under 12.4 hectares of glass. You can see all the fruit going past me now. Um, this is a cherry type and uh, we've got 500,000 plants growing here. Now these 12.4 hectares equates to about 14 football pitches so it's a big big area. You can see the glass above me. Uh, yeah that's um, just over five meters tall and these paths are 100 meters long. Um, but we have really close control on this big area so what I was going to talk about is the watering. So we water all these plants every square meter so this row is actually 155 square meters um, but every square meter in the summer has about 10 liters of water applied um, and it's applied through these laces see there and it's measured right down to the milliliter <clears throat> so water comes in through this lace and into the block into the cube where the roots are and then down into this bag underneath and this is where all the fresh root growth is so you can see in here um, the white roots are the new roots and they're the best they're the ones we want they're where all the nutrients or uptake goes on so then it's up into the plant and all the way up through the stem and it's really the leaves that cause the suction for the roots so where we add heat into our glass house through these pipes you can see down here these heating pipes hot air comes up rises rises past the leaves and this is like the plants exercise so as the heat goes past the leaves the plants get hot and that encourages them like us to sweat and um, so the leaves transpire and water comes out through the surface of the leaf to cool the leaf down as it does that carbon dioxide goes in but as water leaves um, that's where the pressure comes and that's where the suction comes from the roots so we're kind of making these plants work harder by adding heat to them they take up more water they also take in more co2 um, co2 by the way that's in this tube here so it's an inflated tube and it's got little holes in there and that CO2 is pumped into the glass house and increases the CO2 levels in here by about three times. So outside it's around 400 parts per million in the air. In here we like it about 1200 or the plants like it around 1200. So that's all absorbed into the leaves and gives nice bright uh, fresh tasty fruit. Okay session we've learned about the functions or jobs of different plant parts, we have grouped these varying plant parts and worked on an investigation. We've used a cowl diagram to sort and group different fruits and things that you might in the past have called vegetables. We also looked at pollination because the flower is very important in the next generation seed production and you can also check out the environment activities on the STEM Hub website. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.